friends for last one month you know i've been receiving uh, you know many requests from within and outside india uh, to share my objective views regarding the two new farm laws actually there are three laws third being the essential commodity laws but in principle there are two laws but as the you know the the window of the timeline which is allocated to me is only 20 minutes hence you know i will not be able to take you through each and every provision of these two laws rather i would be focusing more on bringing about clarity regarding the effect impact and consequence of these two laws there are massive apprehensions and and reservations about the implications of these two laws so it is fundamental for all of us to get to know about these laws scrupulously and consensually i am saying this because we must realize that these laws are incredibly unique for these are based on according to me four key broad considerations scientific uh, economic social and legal now what mistake most of us are doing is that we are looking at these laws from a very short sighted approach short sighted or narrower perspective which is causing prejudice in our minds these laws must be understood in the background of as i mentioned scientific socio economic and legal parameters which have to be put together i mean you can't deal with them uh, in compartments so let me try to bring forth my you know own understanding uh, as to the legitimacy and reasonableness of these two laws which i consider are based on the research done my by me and 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 what i comprehend let me first give you a brief analysis of the existing regime which operates under the agriculture produce market committees uh, apmc act and then i will take you uh, through the new laws and finally i will cover uh, the the significance attached with the socio economic and scientific grounds around agriculture so first you know under the apmc regime the farmers are obligated to sell their produce through the auction of uh, auction which which are conducted at the markets or mandis which operate under the said apmc act and they are led by the lic uh, licensed traders in other words wholesalers or retail traders or food processing entities cannot purchase farm produce directly from the farmers they have to go through the mandis only you know and 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 mandis have monopoly or i would even go to the extent of saying a cartel or or a or a domination in a way the licensed traders and commission agents run an informal syndicate at mandis auctions are i am told hardly transparent now the payments to farmers under the apmc act are delayed considerably in the in in, in the mandis and if on the spot prompt payments are made they imply indiscriminate discounts uh, you know at, at the cost of the farmers there is hardly any organized paperwork to support these sale purchase transactions what does that lead to well all this makes a farmer completely discredited with no good financial standing at all practically speaking the the farmers can receive just about i would say 1/4 to 1/3 of the of the market rates at the mandis this is not all you know uh you know to to make you know everything uh, more than worse the middlemen at the at the mandi uh, or at the mandis you know they charge commission on both seller that is the farmer and the buyer uh the the even the market retailer or wholesaler or or food processor 
एंड वॉट वैल्यू एडिशन डू दीज कमीशन एजेंट्स डू नथिंग now i won't say negligible but it's nothing these agents have no resource or amenities to do grading or or sorting you know they're just simple brokers who are just facilitating trade and commerce and for which they are charging huge commissions each and every transaction in a mandi is imperiled to market tax and market cess that's again additional cost on the farmer the process of you know getting a license at a mandi is more of an inheritance model because you know you you need a shop or a warehouse in the mandi you know to get a license which is next to impossible uh, to find uh, you know for a for a new aspirant entrant because all the shops wholesale uh, all uh, and, and wholesale uh, warehouses are taken now let us take the new deal with the new laws one by one explaining how the provisions are actually intended to help the farmers and not to in any way jeopardize or endanger their livelihood or incomes uh, as is being perceived by a section of of, of the society first the farmers produce trade and commerce promotion and facilitation act 2020 in short let us call it fptc act it provides for the creation of an ecosystem where the farmers and traders enjoy enormous freedom of choice relating to sale and purchase of farmers produce they can sell within apmc mandis or outside them so apmc mandis are not eliminated by the new law how does this fptc act benefit the farmers you know that's my question well and my answer is this will facilitate remunerative prices through competitive alternative trading channels it is natural that when you have more buyers one gets better sale price and the end user which is the consumer like one of us also gets a good quality produce at a better price and you know more choice as well because you know uh, uh, so many commissions and taxes and cases are eliminated out of the cost the provisions of the statute go to promote efficient transparent and barrier free interstate and intrastate trade and commerce of farmers produce outside obviously the the physical uh you know premises uh, uh of the market or deemed market uh, notified under various state agriculture uh, uh produce market legislations so not only that the the statute is Uh, that is the act also provides a facilitative framework for electronic trading which is the future i mean i can take you through each and every provision of the act each provision is a measure to grant i would say protection and security to the farmers the significant misconception uh, Uh, is is that this act affects and governs uh, state apmc or mandis this is absolutely false perception this act talks about trade and commerce outside the physical boundaries of any trading areas public or private run by the market committees formed under each state apmc act APMC commission agents and 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 operators i i i think are nervous because they have to com- now compete uh, with, with trans- more transparent uh, efficient and professional competitors their cartel the existing cartel is 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 getting broken down it is get it is collapsing or or is under the, under the scanner now giving you some instances of statutory 
provisions, specific ones under this act. Section 4, for instance, obligates every trader, uh, you know, who transacts with farmers to make payment for the trade, uh, traded farmers produce on the same day or within maximum three days, three working days, if procedurally so required. Section 6 categorically mandates uh, that that no market fee or cess or levy by whatever name called uh, uh, under any state AM, APMC act or any law shall be levied on any form, farmer for trade and commerce. So there is no commission, no levy, no tax, no cess on the farmer. Now talking about dispute resolutions, it is an admitted fact that that all the courts of law today are overburdened with litigation cases the litigants in india are frustrated for because of the the delay in 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 justice it takes years and decades for resolution of disputes and for poor people the administration of justice system is is largely inaccessible due to heavy cost of litigation and logistical issues as well. Courts are uh, located far off. Now, alternative dispute resolution mechanism is the need of the hour and has been globally embraced due to its transparency, efficiency and above all, speedy disposal. Now, that is what Section 8 of this Act, FPTC Act says or enables, you know, an efficient process of conciliation by no other than the nominated representatives of the farmer who is involved in the dispute. The law provides for serious penalties and rapid recovery from the traders uh, in favor of the farmers. And in the interest of justice, there are three layers of alternative dispute resolution available to the farmers. So, and there is no litigation cost at all. So, according to me, the farmers under, under the new law gets to sell their produce right at their doorstep, gets prompt payments and in case of any dispute, the justice is available to him right at the threshold. What more would a farmer need? You tell me. What more would a farmer aspire you know, to succeed, to earn well, to be happy and, 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 uh, and, and grow? Now taking up the second law, the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Services Act 2020. In short, we can call it as APAFS Act, you know, agreement of with regard to price assurance and farm services. It provides for a standardized national framework on farming agreements that protects and empowers farmers to engage with agribusiness firms, agribusiness firms, uh, processors, uh, wholesalers, exporters, or large retailers for farm services and sale of future farming produce at a mutually agreed remunerative price uh, under a fair framework which is fair and transparent. Remember that already there are 20 states, around about 20 states in India which have adopted contract farming. Even the state APMC acts for instance, you know, provide for contract farming but it's all you know, zigzag, haphazard. There is no uniformity. The new law simplifies, standardizes and improves earlier versions. The new act swings, I would say, the balance in favor of the farmers. It eliminates the complex system of registration, licensing, deposits and numerous other compliances in contract farming. Uh, provisions in, in, in various uh, states. 
Now, discussing, for instance, some of the specifics of this act, section 3 of the act, I would like to quote, specifically, you know, it, it places the responsibility of all compliances of legal requirement for providing farm services on the sponsor of the farm service, uh, on the sponsor or the farm service provider, beg your pardon. And you know what farm services include under the act? These include supply of seeds, feed, fodder, agrochemicals, machinery and technology, advice, agricultural advice, non-chemical, agro inputs and such other inputs for farming. You know, this is so beneficial for the farmer, uh, for the farmers as a whole. This is the new era of modern technology and infrastructure. Why are rural youth are migrating to the urban and not wanting to engage in agriculture? Have you, have you pondered over that? Because agriculture is strenuous and involves physical hardship today in the absence of modern means of technology, comfort, infrastructure and tools of agriculture. They are all very primitive, does not attract youth at all. Now, because agriculture is not lucrative because of old technology, the number of you know, migrants who move from rural to urban areas stood at 52 million as per census of 2001. The share of rural to urban migrants in the population rose from 5.06% in 2001 to 6.5% in 2011. And so we need to make an honest endeavor to overcome these challenges, to stop the migration from rural to urban. Further, Section 3 of the Act also says that no farming agreement shall be entered, uh, shall be entered into by a farmer in derogation of any rights of a sharecropper. You know what sharecropper is, you know, we call in Hindi Bataidar or Mujera or simply putting it, you know, a tiller or, or occupier or, or tenant of the land. And the agreements of farming cannot be endless in perpetuity under the Act. The Act prescribes having mutually acceptable quality, grade and standards of, of a farming produce, which are compatible, you know, with the agronomics practices, agro-climate, and uh, such other factors, you know, which are relevant, you know, and government agencies will provide full assistance and aid to the farmers on, 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 on this decision making. I mean, this will undoubtedly enable a high grade quality of produce, which will fetch lucrative price and not only in domestic markets, even in international markets. This will obviously encourage farmers to, to venture into newer ideas and, and non-conventional crops other than, uh, you know, paddy and wheat, you know, which has become very popular because of MSP. Now, most importantly, I mean, I'll discuss MSP as well later in my lecture. You know, Section 5 of the Act prescribes, you know, about the guaranteed price to be paid for the purchase of a farming produce in the farming agreement. A guaranteed price to be paid to the farmers. Also, Section 6 makes the buyer responsible for taking the delivery of any farming produce and making payment on the spot. This thoroughly secures the farmers. Thoroughly secures the farmers by any means. Now, you know, for addressing the farmers' uh, uh, fear of losing uh, their land, uh, Section 8 of the Act directly prohibits any farming agreement leading to, to any transfer, including sale, lease and mortgage of, of the land or premises of the farmer, or even raising any permanent structure or making any modification on, on the land or, or, or premises 
of the farmer unless the sponsor agrees to remove such structure and and restore it back to its original condition at his own cost so i mean farmer can never lose his land under any of the statutes never all disputes under the the farming agreements will will be resolved by and large uh, uh, in, in the same manner as discussed earlier under the previous uh, new law fptc act you know there is the same mechanism of dispute resolution alternate dispute resolution now let me uh, as i'm short of time let me finally address the issue of msp the farmers are you know amplifying a lot about this issue of msp which according to me is a non issue let us understand briefly you know what what is the concept of msp what is this minimum support price what is it you know we need to understand th this concept in some brief words well the minimum support price is an agricultural product price that is set by the government of india in order to purchase directly from the farmer now how is this rate fixed well this rate first of all acts as a safeguard for the farmer as it provides a minimum price or a minimum profit let's say for the harvest irrespective of the market conditions now in india a committee set up under uh, swaminathan M ms swaminathan in in 2006 had recommended that msp uh, should be uh, must be you know at least 50% more than the cost of production the center currently fixes msps for 23 farm commodities based on the recommendations uh, of the commission for agriculture uh, costs and prices uh, cacp in short form now these are according to me seven cereals and five pulses and some commercial crops as well it is not a such statutory provision it is only a government policy that is part of an administrative decision making the government declares msps for crops but there is there is no law mandating their implementation it is just a government's public policy measure now as per certain reports nearly 89% of the rice produced by the farmers 89% of the rice produced by the farmers in punjab is procured by the government and if i was to talk about haryana it is 85% now farmers in punjab and haryana face no price risk and this is this in fact in incentivizes the farmers to grow more and more paddy and wheat and not to venture in any other crop well this is dangerous according to me and i will tell you why as we go along along you know now let me touch upon some socio economic and scientific reasons behind the logic and reasonableness of the new laws where i will also connected with paddy and wheat and msp first do you know for a fact that when india became independent agriculture agriculture accounted for about 55% of the gdp yes and employed 60% of the population the same gdp contribution from agriculture share has fallen down significantly and hugely to 17% from 55% to 17% in 2019 2020 and still agriculture continues to employ about half the country's population so something has gone seriously wrong somewhere because half of india's population depends on the sector for income but their contribution to the gdp has not been impressive at all it has it is sliding down hugely now so agriculture definitely needs reforms it definitely needs private investments for modernization and revamp second 
there is also imbalance between domestic demand and supply. India is holding a huge surplus of some commodities. And at the same time, it is importing huge quantities of edible oils and pulses. India is also importing uh, fruits and vegetables, which can be very well grown in India domestically and, and could be sold for, for price definitely better than wheat and rice. But nobody is venturing into it because of MSP. Third, do you know that agricultural divisions, this is important, do you know that the agricultural divisions such as horticulture, milk and fishery are witnessing better annual growth? It's about 4 to 10 percent as compared to the miserable, dismal growth rate in cereals which stands at 1.1 percent. This is because the letter uh, in the latter case, there is MSP, minimum support price, and other government level interference. Whereas in the former case, the market intervention by the government is negligible. So wherever government doesn't interfere, there is more growth. Now, do you know that India still remains outside the International Agreement on Agriculture at WTO? You know, because countries in WTO have opposed India's MSP mechanism, which is a subsidized mechanism. It is, it is opposed to open and free market concept, which makes the participant more sustainable. I mean, in, in the open and free market in the long run. I mean, Indian farmers, you know, I would say need to wake up and, com and, and compete within India and even internationally. I mean, they can, they can become really big. Uh, and and if, if I was to compare them with farmers in China and Israel, they're, they're doing exceptionally well. Now, more importantly, you know, do you know that the private sector investment represents hilarious? Private sector investment represents less than 2% of the total investments in, in, in the agriculture sector. And less than 0.5% ridiculous of the annual investments of the corporate sector in the Indian economy. So, so low. Now to boost and modernize the agriculture sector, there is an urgent necessity by all means to stimulate private sector investments. There is a need. And coming back to the China point, you know, do you know that, that China produces three times more agri output than India from a smaller cultivable area. And only about 26% of China's workforce is in agriculture as compared to India's 50% or let's say 42% to be precise uh, in, the, in the agriculture sector. You know. Now the average holding size in China is much smaller. Hence, there is there is no question that small holders can also do marvels. I mean, if, if they're offered the proper incentives, good quality infrastructure and research support. And yes, and the right institutional framework to operate. So, I mean, India can overtake China, you know, if these farm laws are executed in the right spirit. And do you know that in the state of Punjab, almost 80% of its agriculture blocks have got overexploited, meaning the, the withdrawal of water in those blocks, 80% blocks, is much more than the recharge or replenishment. As uh, Sardara Singh, uh, Sardara Singh Johal, a legendary uh, you know, Indian agriculture economist, once remarked, uh, this is a disaster in the making and, and a business as usual scenario will, will lead to desertification of Punjab because it's losing water. And this is because, you know, paddy cultivation on more than 3 million hectares in Punjab, 3 million hectares for paddy. This tent amounts to producing rice at the cost of depleting sweet groundwater. 
as another acclaimed agriculture economist ashok gulati also you know quoted uh, a famous proverb it really appealed to me uh, the proverb says we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors we borrow it from our children we don't inherit it from our in, in, uh, ancestors we borrow it from our children i could I, i could have said much more regarding scientific and socio economic aspects but there is time constraint uh, uh, and 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 i have already exceeded the allocated timelines hence uh, let me close uh, my lecture now uh, you may feel free to throw questions at me via the uh, via the moderator thank you so much see you again bye bye